God, I missed that jingle. Hello everyone and welcome back to what I hope to be the glorious return of Fuel the Pedal podcast. I am still your host, Gabriel Martins, broadcasting from Girona area, land of cyclists and my new home, work office and cycling playground. For those of you who just got here or are listening to this far into the future, let it be known that Fuel the Pedal had a bit of a pause for around one and a half years. And the reason for that, as many of you might know, was because I was offered a position as a nutritionist with uh, Israel Premier Tech World Tour Cycling Team back in January 2021, which really turned my world upside down and made it really difficult to continue with the podcast. But hopefully now I can organize myself and resume podcasting while still working in pro cycling. This experience has been tremendously rewarding, emotional, full of ups and downs, but has surely given me very important insights as to the practical application and especially the limitations in the application, I must say, of the many uh, topics covered here in the podcast. So I hope these perspectives from inside the Pro Peloton can enrich the discussions that we have here on the podcast from now on, as I let you know about some of my experiences. But today I won't get into much detail on it, instead we'll move right into our episode and first of all I must apologize to both Alana McKay and Pete Peeling as this interview was recorded right before I joined the team and has been pending editing and launching from my side so for that Alana, Pete and also to you the listeners apologies for my delay but hopefully this come back and make up to it. This episode was supposed to be a part two of a two-episode series along with the previous episode with Rachel McCormick and Pete Pilling where we talked about iron deficiency in endurance athletes, which I encourage you to listen to for a better understanding about today's talk, about ketogenic diets, carbohydrate availability and how these can affect iron status in endurance athletes. Now, since this episode was recorded a while ago, I reached out to both Alana and Pete to try and understand if there had been any recent advances in this area, but they both agreed that the knowledge in this very specific topic hasn't progressed much since then and these contents are still up to date. So, without further ado, let's get into this long pending episode 41 with Alana McKay and Pete Peeling ketogenic diets, carbohydrate availability, and iron regulation in endurance athletes. Up next on Fuel the Pedal Podcast. Alana, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here with us, Alana. And Pete, welcome back once again. Yep, really good. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you back, Pete. But... Alana, you are the new voice here since listeners already had the chance to be introduced to Pete. So I would ask you to please present yourself and the research you've been involved with. Yeah, so my name is Alana McKay. Uh, I'm currently working at Australian Catholic University in the Mary McKillop Institute of Health Research within Louise Burke's team based in Canberra in Australia. In August this year, I submitted my PhD, which was Uh, completed at the University of Western Australia uh, in conjunction with the Australian Institute of Sport and also the Western Australian Institute of Sport where I spent um, most of my time during my PhD. And my PhD primarily looked at the effect of dietary manipulation and specifically carbohydrate and energy manipulations on both iron regulation and immune function. But I guess it was the iron part of the thesis that probably caught my attention most and um, I've done much more work in that area since. And I was pretty lucky during my PhD that Pete was my primary supervisor, so I got to learn from the best when it came to iron metabolism. And I was also really lucky to be connected with Louise Burke um, and work with her throughout my PhD. And I worked a lot with her on the Supernova study series, so that's where we did lots of training camp-based research with elite level athletes and since finishing my PhD and moving across to Canberra to work with her we've continued to look into the applied athlete research realm and yeah my main focus going forward still is iron metabolism. Well some very kind words here for you Pete Uh, I'm afraid that now I do have to ask you to say something back and maybe for the listeners who are listening to this episode before the previous one I would uh, ask you to present yourself again if you're so kind. Yeah, so, um, well, yep, so Pete Peeling, um, Alana is is far too kind. She is a, a very independent student, and certainly Louise Burke was um, integral to the work that 
Alana did, but I am a humble servant of them both. And uh, I work at the WA Institute of Sport and the uh, um, University of Western Australia. I teach and research at the university and I look after a research program at the Institute of Sport where we attempt to answer coach-driven questions and try and provide some uh, evidence-based answers to the problems that they're dealing with. Um, so we have um, a relationship with five four universities in WA at the moment and a, a collective of about 10 PhD students spread across multidisciplinary kind of areas attempting to answer those questions. And that is surely visible in the great research that you've been publishing throughout the years on a variety of different topics. But today our focus is going to be uh, on the topic of uh, ketogenic dieting and carbohydrate manipulation and its effects in iron status and iron metabolism in endurance athletes, which has been the focus of your research group, more specifically uh, Alana's PhD. And um, while on the previous episode of this series we focus our attention on strategies to treat iron deficiency in athletes, today we'll be talking about the impact of acute and chronic uh, carbohydrate restriction in iron metabolism, which includes, of course, a, a periodized carbohydrate approach and inevitably, as we mentioned before, a low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet. In addition, we'll be also talking about uh, the role of epsidin and low iron status with low energy availability in athletes. And since epsidin has such a central role in both these series, it might be a good starting point to remind the listeners on the role of uh, epsidin in iron regulation and how can nutrient and energy availability impact on iron regulation so we can tackle those scenarios in more detail throughout this episode. I would perhaps start with you, Pete. Yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe a, a recap for those that uh, listen to to both of, of the uh, episodes and, and something new for those that jump in here. But uh, hepcidin uh, is a liver-produced peptide uh, that is produced uh, as a homeostatic mechanism in the body to regulate iron uptake at the level of the gut. So when we consume iron in our diet, um, it moves through into our intestine and to move that across at the gut level we need to move it across these transport export cells known as ferroportin and what hepcidin does is it's generated on the basis of how much iron we need and how much iron is coming through the gut and if we have an increase in iron levels uh, we tend to produce more hepcidin to kind of down regulate how much of that we would absorb and if we have a need for iron then we would reduce the amount of hepcidin that's in circulation in order to encourage iron across the gut so we know there are a number of things that uh, regulate the hepcidin response one of those is the iron stores in the body and we tend to measure that in the form of serum ferritin so if we have really uh, good levels of ferritin in the body we tend to also have probably higher levels of circulating hepcidin, especially when we eat iron, because the body may not need to absorb too much of it. So what we do know is that too much iron is actually toxic. So in the context of talking about uh, iron that we're providing to athletes, it's not a case of more is better. We just want an optimal level of iron. So when ferritin levels are high, we tend to produce more hepcidin. But we also know that another uh, regulator of hepcidin in the body is inflammation. And specifically, uh, one of the cytokines uh, known as interleukin-6 seems to regulate the hepcidin response as well. So when we have an inflammatory stimulus, we tend to produce more hepcidin, which means that we would have a reduction in the amount of iron coming through the gut. And the reason we do that is because an inflammatory stimulus is usually associated with some kind of illness or sickness or issue in the body. And we don't want to absorb a lot of iron when we're in that state because it could be potentially harmful to the individual um, from a from a from um, uh, an evolutionary perspective. So hepcidin seems to be a mechanism to kind of downplay the amount of iron that we can absorb at the gut. We also know that hypoxia is another stimulus of, uh, of the liver, but it, it actually suppresses hepcidin levels. So when we go to altitude, for instance, uh, one of the key things that we're trying to do at altitude is to adapt to the environment. And so we want to produce new red blood cells. Um, so in a hypoxic situation, we would actually reduce the amount of hepcidin that we're producing so that we could get more iron across the gut. And that way we would use that for the adaptation of the red blood cells. So there are lots of things that regulate hepcidin, but overall hepcidin is a hormone we're producing to try and regulate the amount of iron that we can get across the gut. 
Yeah, thanks for coming back to this point, Pete. So, hepcidin plays a key role in regulating iron absorption, and the hepcidin levels often reflect our current iron status, with high levels of ferritin and, interestingly, inflammation itself, as you mentioned, uh, resulting in higher hepcidin levels to regulate the amount of iron that is absorbed. This is important to understand how iron absorption is regulated in the human body. So and now I turn to you, Alana, and to start introducing this topic of carbohydrate availability on iron regulation, perhaps we could start by explaining the listeners what happens when an athlete engages in a typical carbohydrate periodization model, for example, a sleep low, train low, which would result in reduced uh, muscle glycogen levels. So how would this scenario influence absolute activity? activity and iron regulation? Yeah, so um, coming back to factors that regulate hepcidin, as Pete discussed, inflammation is a key one. And when we're talking about exercising with low muscle glycogen stores, we know that this can augment or increase the inflammatory response to exercise. And so if we're exercising in this state and having a greater inflammatory response, uh, it was hypothesized that we may also be seeing greater hepcidin levels three hours later. Uh, and one of Pete's um, earlier students, Claire Badenhorst, actually published a, an initial study where she used a 24-hour period of diet and exercise to manipulate the glycogen stores and then assess the iron regulatory response. And she did see a trend towards higher hepcidin levels when athletes were training in that low glycogen state. And that probably raised some early questions and where my PhD started was because if we're thinking of some of the current sports nutrition strategies that endurance athletes are adopting, um, some of these carbohydrate periodization strategies may then also be having an influence on iron regulation. So uh, one study we looked at or we conducted looked at elite level triathletes. So we had a bunch of Australian elite level triathletes and we implemented uh, a train high, sleep low, train low carbohydrate periodization protocol. So essentially they did an afternoon training session where they had high carbohydrate availability and by the end of that session the glycogen stores were depleted and then they had a low carbohydrate dinner uh, they slept in a low state and conducted a low intensity training session the following morning and so we actually had them do this twice so that well, four times in total twice with low uh, carbohydrate availability and once um, within that they did a cycling session which actually ended up being of higher intensity and longer duration, and they also did a running session, which was very, very low intensity. And what we saw was that with the running session, when the intensity was very low, um, we saw that when athletes were either having low carbohydrate availability or high carbohydrate availability, there was no differences in the hepcidin response three hours post-exercise. However, during the cycling session, once the intensity increased, um, and it increased by about 10 beats per minute in heart rate, on average, um, we did see that hepcidin levels were about 80% higher uh, when athletes implemented this train low, sleep low uh, protocol compared to when they had consistently high carbohydrate availability. And to summarize what that might mean, um, if they were having increased hepcidin responses when they were training low and sleeping low, uh, that may imply that they're having impaired iron absorption in the hours following exercise. And if they're implementing this regularly, that could um, over time start to affect an athlete's iron stores. But on the positive note of what we were seeing, uh, current recommendations and ideas around how we implement these strategies in elite endurance athletes really says that we should be um, targeting the very low intensity training sessions with these uh, sleep low approaches so that we can maximize adaptation. And from that standpoint, um, that sort of aligns with the ideas around iron regulation. However, best practice sports nutrition guidelines still say that those sessions that are higher in intensity and require quality training should be fueled with high carbohydrate availability. Really interesting to see how hepcidin was only elevated in the group performing higher intensity exercise. And again, as you mentioned, this might indicate that endurance athletes starting some exercise sessions in a carbohydrate restricted state or in a muscle glycogen depleted or partially depleted state might want to perform lower intensity exercise or play closer attention to iron if performing a high intensity endurance exercise in this state. 
but carbohydrate manipulations are not limited to restricting or not restricting carbohydrate before exercise. Carbohydrates are also consumed during exercise and perhaps cycling is the best example of this due to the longer uh, duration of the uh, training sessions. So Pete, would carbohydrate feedings during exercise be able to influence or at least mitigate this elevation of abscidin in response to higher intensity during a low carb periodization model? Yeah, I think from the collective of the research that we've done, um, we we've tried to uh, provide carbohydrate as a as a fuel source, but also to attenuate the inflammatory response at different periods during an during an exercise task. And this initially came because uh, one of our students, uh, Mark Sim, from a, a little while ago now, he was reading around and and had seen some work uh, where um, pr the provision of a carbohydrate solution during exercise was shown to attenuate interleukin-6. And the group that did this um, then went on to, to measure hepcidin levels immediately post-exercise and 24 hours later. And they didn't see, although they saw a dampening of interleukin-6 from giving a uh, carbohydrate solution during exercise, they didn't see an impact on the hepcidin response post-exercise, but they, they measured the hepcidin at what we subsequently found to probably be at a time where you, you wouldn't have seen an elevation. They kind of missed the bit in the middle where you would expect an elevation. So Mark went on to rerun the study and, and he used what you would probably consider to be a little bit more normal carbohydrate uh, levels so that the study that he had read used almost a, a super dose of carbohydrate to influence IL-6. And in Mark's study, he then measured hepcidin levels at the more opportune times from some of our prior work that would was around that three-hour post-exercise window when we, we thought that um, interleukin-6 was influencing the hepcidin. And um, Mark didn't uh, reproduce those results and wasn't able to attenuate uh, hepcidin levels post-exercise by giving carbohydrate during the actual work itself. And and that's what kind of led to Claire Badenhorst's work where she looked at um, the pre-exercise prospect because we'd, we'd tried manipulations during exercise and after exercise and after exercise, it's already too late. The stimulus has already occurred. The inflammation's already there. You can't really impact it once it's happened. So it, it really led us to start thinking about that pre-exercise uh, prospect. And, and so as Alana suggested, uh, what Claire did was she uh, put individuals through a glycogen depletion run on day one and then she fed them a low carbohydrate or a high carbohydrate meal overnight. And so the low, low carb group came in glycogen depleted. And um, when they ran the next day, that, that glycogen depleted group had a significantly greater inflammatory response to the same exercise stimulus as, as the carbohydrate repleted group. Um, and there was a, a trend which we picked up through some effect sizes um, to suggest there was some differences in their hepcidin response also, although that, that wasn't significantly different, so put that out there, but there were certainly some differences in there that was picked up with these effect sizes. So on the basis of that collective information, I think it's really hard to influence it during because you probably can't consume enough carbs to, to really have an impact on inflammation during the actual exercise. Certainly isn't uh, effective to feed carbohydrate immediately after exercise to try and alter these responses. So so the collective of that would say that it's really about uh, the, the glycogen depletion and what's happening prior to exercise uh, that's having an impact here. Interesting. So glycogen status appears to be the main driver for abscidin regulation alongside with inflammation from uh, exercise. But I can't help but wonder what happens with an extreme scenario, Pete, of a grand tour like the Tour de France where athletes ingest incredibly high amounts of carbohydrate on top of a tremendous physical uh, effort day after day. Well, I, I think um, it's it's a really interesting question. So the the Grand Tour uh, event would be like an extreme that it would be really good to to measure some of these things. Quite hard to uh, to convince an athlete to do a venous sample <laughs> during a Grand Tour to, yeah. to check whether or not um, these things are happening. But what I would say is it's so multifaceted that yes, we know there's a link between inflammation and, and hepcidin activity. And, and that's one of the key um, variables that we deal with. But we also know that, um, that the underlying iron levels are having an impact. And we also know that the underlying 
uh, glycogen levels are having an impact and whether that stems back to inflammation or not, um, it, it probably is a signal on IL-6, which is is about the liver producing some, some glucose for the body to, to fuel the work that's being done. So they're all interlinked and it's so multifaceted that it's really hard to know which one is, is driving the hepcidin um, response the most. But you've got to account for all of these things within that type of analysis. But I, I think back to your question, certainly the, um, in the context that you, that it was pitched around, can you affect it durian? I'd, I think it's quite hard to do that. I think it's quite hard to, to consume the amount of carbs that you would need to do that. And therefore, the bigger driver in, in this specific setting would be about um, glycogen repletion. Mm-hmm. Alana, what would you add to this? How would iron stores fluctuate during an extreme situation like a cycling grand tour? Yeah, I would completely expect iron stores to decrease during a tour. I think that's, um, yeah, 100% likely. Um, if you're thinking of those, you know, six-hour rides and knowing that you're probably never going to be able to consume enough carbohydrate to keep up with that completely, on top of that sort of inflammation, um, the drive over that time to decrease iron would surely happen. And even in some of our race walking studies where we've done three weeks of intensified training, um, and that's hard training but nowhere near that level of a, a tour, we've mm-hmm. seen decreases in iron stores around 20 to 40% um, just in that three-week period. Um, so, yeah, I would 100% expect iron stores to decrease. But at the same time, during that racing period, whether iron or maintaining iron um, is the main goal as such in that, um, as long as you avoid depletion, I don't think it's too much of an issue because as soon as the tour finishes, you can you can work on rebuilding that and maybe considering some of those iron regular responses a bit more. But it's all about performance at that time. So mm-hmm. makes sense, Alana. And how about the post exercise carbohydrate intake? So we know that it's some in some training and competition like scenarios where muscle glycogen resynthesis is a priority to perform well, and a Grand Tour is of course an example of that. Uh, athletes should aim to 1.2 grams per kilo per hour over a period of four hours, one to four hours. Uh, But there are other situations as part of a training low protocol where we intentionally restrict carbohydrate in this post-exercise period to enhance training adaptation. So, uh, Alana, does restricting carbohydrate in this period exert any influence on epsidin and iron regulation? Or does it come down to your muscle glycogen status prior to the next training session? Yeah, so there's been a couple of studies that have looked at restricting carbohydrate intake during that post-exercise period, but n- none of them have shown that there's an effect on IL-6 or hepcidin levels um, when you restrict carbohydrate in that sort of one to or post-exercise up to four hours post-exercise. Um, and as Pete sort of talked about, he suggested that maybe uh, manipulating carbohydrate intake during exercise occurs too late. Um, I think it's the same and if not more, if you're manipulating carbohydrate availability after exercise where that inflammatory stimulus has already sort of occurred, um, you're unlikely to see any effect on hepcidin. Mm. Um, But nobody's really looked at that restriction um, post-exercise and then going into another training session three hours post-exercise. So um, in terms of restricting carbohydrate in order or as a sort of carbohydrate periodization strategy between sessions, um, I would say that would have an influence because then, again, you're lowering the glycogen stores going into the second exercise session, and that second exercise session may have the elevated hepcidin levels. Mm. But if we're talking purely about recovery from exercise, um, post-exercise ingestion of carbohydrate doesn't appear to impact hepcidin levels. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So as you both already mentioned, glycogen status uh, when the exercise is initiated, in particular if high-intensity exercise is performed, is the main drive for uh, epsidin elevation, which uh, makes sense since uh, training or attempting to train with high intensity, with uh, low glycogen stores, is a more stressful situation for the body and consequently more prone to generate inflammation as a result. But if we were to study this, Solana, how would you suggest this research should be performed? Yeah, I think it's – we've just finished a study with uh, the Men's um, National Training Centre for Rowing, and we're actually looking at um, simply the hepcidin response to two training sessions occurring quite close together. So uh, the only study we could find really was one of Pete's PhD studies, which occurred a very long time ago, and he uh, separated exercise by 12 hours, and we were more interested in what happens with athletes training um, 
or doing exercise sessions much closer together. So we had a three-hour window between exercise sessions. And we're simply looking at the cumulative increase in hepcidin that occurs with double training sessions. Um, and even in that time, we haven't purposely manipulated carbohydrate availability, but with the type of sessions we've had these athletes performing, it's unlikely that they would have um, completely restored their glycogen levels prior to the second session. So I think we need a better understanding of um, the time course of hepcidin in elite athletes training multiple times per day, and then we could probably answer that question a bit more specifically. Hmm. So just to add to to that, and it wasn't that long ago, by the way, but um, <laughs> but just just add, like that's a really good extension of that work, and and the and and it's being done that way for a really different reason. So um, that that initial work was to look at a two session prospect. So does hepcidin levels do hepcidin levels recover um, between sessions if you give it that amount of time? But what we did in that particular study was we exercised them in the evening as session one and in the morning as session two on the basis that we wanted to minimize all of the things that could happen during the day to compromise recovery. So we just had them sleep. And so the point in that study was really to replenish muscle glycogen and and give them as much rest as possible to see what those transient kind of changes were so so alana's work is awesome because it it takes the next step to go okay but that's not actually what happens sessions are done closer together than that athletes partially feed they're still somewhat glycogen depleted so now we're really tapping into okay we know in the ideal setting if you're recovered and you're well fed what happens it recovers um but certainly yeah. that that double spike during a day could be really interesting to kind of figure out, okay, what happens in these situations where glycogen isn't completely restored between sessions. So it's a really good extension. Mm -hmm. Great point, Pete. And I'm glad we were able to generate this discussion and uh, hopefully this can contribute for more research in this area. And it would be really interesting to have a, a time course view of uh, how hepcidin fluctuates during the course of a day and during the course of several days um, in such a scenario so that we could uh, even adjust uh, iron intake in athletes uh, to those fluctuations. So if iron stores are so sensitive to these fluctuations derived from high intensity exercise in endurance type efforts, would you say that we as practitioners are doing a good job in monitoring iron levels in multi-day events such as these, Pete? Yeah, look, I think they are two key ingredients to the response. I think the glycogen availability is one, and I think exercise intensity is is another. But I think two others that are really important here that, that should be added to the mix are the exercise duration. So some really early work um, that was done by a girl called uh, Mia Newland from Florida State University. She looked at the magnitude of hepcidin response to one hour of exercise or two hours of exercise, both done at the same intensity. And the magnitude of effect was actually double in the two hour session. So I think duration is really important to consider. And obviously duration and intensity have this kind of inverse relationship. So they're somewhat related. Um, but I also think the, the fourth factor that's really important here is, is the underlying iron stores that the athlete actually has. And I'll get Alana to chip in here, but certainly we do know that um, those athletes that are already iron deficient don't produce a lot of hepcidin because their body is basically craving iron to try and adapt to work and is probably not very good at absorbing iron. So we know that underlying ferritin stores, baseline ferritin stores really affect the hepcidin response here as well as all these these other things so it's really multifaceted but um alana i'll throw to you because i know you've you've done some work in in this space and maybe you can talk about your um your two studies that showed different outcomes when you thought about those confounding variables yeah so we uh yeah used a carbohydrate intervention um to manipulate the glycogen stores and what we saw was differences in il6 and we did also see differences in hepcidin but then once we looked at the baseline ferritin stores we did see that there were differences in ferritin as well and so we weren't really sure whether those changes in hepcidin were being driven by uh, the dietary induced IL-6 differences or whether it was just the baseline ferritin and so we did a, a second sort of subgroup analysis where I was able to match those ferritins um, between our two dietary interventions and what we saw that was that despite those changes in IL-6 still being apparent there were now no differences in hepcidin and 
I think that um, sort of supports some of the earlier work we did. Um, there was a paper in 2017 which Pete led where he did a multiple regression analysis and saw that um, uh, underlying serum ferritin and serum iron concentrations by far were the biggest predictors of the um, hepcidin response at three hours post-exercise. And IL-6 did have a much smaller role um, in that regression analysis. Just to, mm-hmm. to, just to add there, I think what that tells us, right, is that this is that homeostatic response. The body goes, hey, inflammatory insult. We already have lots of iron in the system. We don't kind of want to mm-hmm. make anything here worse. So we better crank up the hepcidin to dull down any more iron absorption on the basis that we we might be sick here right so we could be ill that's what the inflammatory insult is and we don't want to feed that illness with iron to propagate it so we're going to shut it down and see what happens but the inflammatory response is transient and therefore so is the hepcidin response um, to an acute exercise stimulus because the body goes oh actually the inflammation's gone we're cool let's kind of get on with it but it's certainly that underlying iron levels that the body goes okay we've got enough iron here there's an inflammatory insult let's regulate and make sure we don't consume or absorb too much iron as a result of that excellent to put it into perspective like that beats i love how we are progressing into the factors that are more important here for epsidin response so we started by mentioning exercise intensity inflammation glycogen stores prior to exercise but we cannot forget uh, exercise duration and the underlying iron status and it's fascinating to see how the body can self-regulate if there's an inflammatory or a, a physical insult as you mentioned pete although transitory it's enough for epsidin to increase uh, and reduce iron absorption perceiving these as uh, hey let's not let more iron in because this can be problematic or iron is critically low guys let's reduce epsidin so that more iron can make its way in uh, like a door that opens and shuts uh. so uh, now on to the question that is uh, right up your alley Alana and probably uh, the one that listeners are more interested or particularly interested in knowing more about so what I'm talking about the effects of Uh, low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets in iron stores and in this iron regulatory response. So, Alana, the mic is yours. Yeah, so um, as I've sort of mentioned about the supernova studies previously, uh, some of my PhD research was really um, embedded in these projects. And what we did is we did a three-week intervention study with uh, athletes, elite-level athletes. They were race walkers, and they were adhering to either a carbohydrate-rich diet or a ketogenic, low-carb, high-fat diet. And so here we're looking at uh, carbohydrate intakes of less than 50 grams per day and fat intakes getting around the 80% of dietary intake mark. Um, So I guess in regard to iron, uh, the first thing to note was really looking at the diets themselves and looking at how much dietary iron was provided by those diets. And what we saw was that uh, the carbohydrate-rich diets provided significantly more iron than the ketogenic diets. Um, And we're looking at it. They both met uh, current recommendations for dietary iron, but the uh, carbohydrate-rich group were consuming, um, on average, about 18 milligrams per day compared to about 13 milligrams per day in the keto group. And the difference really came apparent from those carbohydrate-rich foods that were removed from the keto diet. And in Australia in particular, a lot of those foods like cereals and grains are actually fortified with iron. And so there was a large amount of non-heme iron that was missing from the keto group's diet. And in three weeks, that's probably not going to have a large influence. But if we're thinking of um, the way ketogenic diets are typically adhered to, um, those long, prolonged adherence may have an effect on iron stores. Uh, We also looked at iron regulation. So again, the IL-6 and hepcidin response. Um, And I briefly just talked about this one. So what we saw was that after three weeks, there was really clear differences in the inflammatory response. So the ketogenic group had a much larger inflammatory response compared to those athletes that were adhering to high-carbohydrate diets. And we also saw that three hours later, there were differences in the hepcidin response, but uh, we also saw that there were differences in iron status at that point. And so we, at this point, we're a bit unsure whether those changes in hepcidin were due to uh, the dietary-induced change that we had seen in inflammation or whether it was Um, simply a result of that underlying homeostatic mechanism that um, the differences in iron status were apparent. So we did a follow-up investigation where I took um, a subset of the athletes and were really lucky in that we're able to manage to match somewhat their iron stores between the two dietary groups. 
Uh, and we actually did a third exercise test where we reintroduced carbohydrate into the diet of those ketogenic athletes. And what we saw was that um, once they were still adapted, we still were seeing these clear differences in IL-6. And even after they consumed uh, carbohydrate very acutely, so um, approximately two hours before exercise and throughout that exercise protocol, um, that there were still clear differences in IL-6 and inflammation between the two dietary groups. But now that we had matched serum ferritin levels, we were no longer seeing these differences in hepcidin. So in these particular investigations, it did appear that um, serum ferritin did have the more dominant influence on uh, hepcidin expression and that hepcidin may not be upregulated by the ketogenic diet. But I think there's a few things to consider there still. Firstly, that IL-6 has so many functions in the body and um, Ida Hekua actually did a, another analysis um, at the same time where she was looking at bone metabolism and she saw that IL-6 actually um, did result in some changes in bone formation uh, markers. So uh, whilst we maybe aren't seeing it here in this study where there was effect on iron regulation, there are effects on other body systems that still need to be considered. And also I think this was probably the biggest challenge working with elite race walkers is that we can't include and exclude athletes based on their iron status. So there's not enough elite race walkers in the world to be able to try and match specifically like you may do in a laboratory study. And we kind of have to just work with the serum ferritins that athletes present with. And so we are looking at doing some follow-up studies where we may um, be able to control for this factor a bit more and really look at this response without um, so many confounding variables. And I think the training is another huge one that we really weren't able to control in this study in that the training intensity um, and the quality was uh, reduced in the ketogenic diet from the diet's effect on the athlete itself. So again, over that time period, we are looking at different factors that are influencing um, iron regulation and, and to pinpoint it from the supernova study, I don't think we're able to really get a, a clear idea of what the effect of the keto diet was on iron regulation, but we have some follow-up studies in the work. So hopefully this time next year, I may be able to give you a better answer. Wow, this really is right up your alley, Alana. So you mentioned some really interesting aspects there. So first, the ketogenic diet might be lower in iron, which was visible in your research due to the reduced ingestion of fortified cereals, consequently leading to a lower in iron status, and not because of the keto diet itself, but because of those lower iron stores. But then you went on to do a follow-up study with a subset of those athletes, uh, matched the iron stores, which has to be easier said than done. You did then a third exercise test, uh, and then you could see the isolated effects of that ketogenic diet on IL-6 and inflammation. Um, and even though with no differences in epsidin due to those uh, similar uh, ferritin levels. And also interesting to see that uh, an acute carbohydrate ingestion uh, prior to exercise uh, in the keto-adapted group was not enough to mitigate uh, this um, IL-6 elevation. But then you touched there on something that I would really appreciate if you could elaborate a bit more, which is the, the effect uh, of ketogenic diets uh, on bone metabolism, which we briefly touched here uh, before with uh, Louise Burke and Ida Aikura, as you mentioned. So I know you were a part of that uh, research group, Alana. So is IL-6 and this increased inflammation we see with the ketogenic diet responsible for the changes in bone turnover markers we see described in the research? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I guess um, from these supernova studies, really, Ida and I worked very closely together because we both were under the, the same hypothesis that these changes in IL-6, in my instance, would start to affect hepcidin. And for her, there was um, some studies, I think by Craig Sale and his group, that were showing that IL-6 really um, did determine some of the changes they were seeing in these burnt, bone turnover markers. Um, the interplay between bone and iron at this point is really unknown. Um, and I think if we are seeing sort of um, parallel changes in both this, these systems, I think they probably are interplaying. And we actually have a, a PhD student over at ACU now that's actually really looking at um, the interplay between these two systems. Um, but I think it's likely that if we are seeing, um, particularly through this uh, inflammatory mechanism, if if the inflammatory mechanism is there, the ketogenic diet probably is affecting both of these systems concurrently. Hmm. 
Sure, so let's hope for more data to come on this interplay between these two systems. So moving on to another aspect which can be relevant to our discussion. So far we've been talking about carbohydrate manipulation and this has been on the spotlight of this episode, but there's one additional aspect that appears to be also relevant in this matter, which is low energy availability and red S. And this can occur due to energy restriction, excessive energy expenditure, or even both. So Pete, now I turn to you. Is there a link between low energy availability and iron metabolism, which can be relevant to today's discussion? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, LEA and the Red S um, combine, I think they lend themselves naturally to situations where uh, iron status is, is compromised. And there's some, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation where we're not really sure if uh, the low iron status contributes to uh, Red S and LEA or if the red S LEA kind of situation uh, results in poor iron stores and, and maybe it's a combination of both and they, they, they work um, on each other at different times. But certainly you can imagine that if you've got a situation where you've got low energy intake, um, you, your consumption of food is such that you would have a reduction in the overall iron intake as well. So, so there's one one way that we can see that iron is compromised in terms of intake because overall energy intake is reduced in, in these settings. But um, certainly there's some work, uh, there's some literature out there that shows that resting hepcidin levels were actually increased uh, in a group of elite athletes that were exposed to a, a three-day uh, low energy availability diet. And within that group, uh, hepcidin levels are increased, but, but post-exercise uh, interleukin-6 levels, so the inflammatory response was actually increased in the in the LEA group, uh, although the hepcidin response post-exercise was the same. So we, we've got these increased resting levels, post-exercise uh, increases in hepcidin that are, are similar. So it seems to point towards a non-inflammatory driven uh, increase in hepcidin that's resulting from the LEA situation. And if you read through that literature, and uh, Alana made this really great link that um, one of the one of the things that we talked about in the first podcast was the altitude setting, and we talked about erythroferone, and we said that when an athlete goes to altitude, uh, they get an increase in erythroferone, uh, which actually decreases the hepcidin levels to allow them to adapt to that environmental stress. Um, in in Alana's review, she talks about erythroferone in a different way, such that starvation can actually drive down erythroferone levels and therefore we've got a decrease in ERFI, that might be the reason why we've got this increase in hepcidin which lends itself to a reduction in, in iron absorption and iron stores which could be part of that kind of overall low iron status in LEA situations. So you can see that chicken and egg conundrum, where's it coming from? Is it is it the iron driving the low energy and the, the red S symptoms or is it these two things that are driving the iron deficiency and and of course as a result of that question there's certainly a lot more work that can be done in that space but i think um alana would have a lot to say on this too yeah i think i think the biggest factor is probably the reduced energy intake which would reduce dietary iron intake i think that over time is having a big effect and also if we're looking at increased energy expenditure and we're also looking at increased hepcidin peaks um, in terms of post-exercise exercise induced iron losses i think that's probably the largest contributor but Pete really nicely explained you know we are seeing increases in resting hepcidin and there's been another study actually really recently published in a military group where they induced low energy availability um, and saw a very similar thing where resting hepcidin was increased and it does appear to occur via a non-inflammatory mechanism um, and in the review we did speculate sort of some some potential mechanisms that we think. The other one that I think is probably a good one or a, a likely one in terms of elite athletes is we do see that testosterone and um, estrogen can play a role in regulating hepcidin. And if we are seeing uh, decreases resulting from low energy availability that we see as part of the Red S model, um, that may have an effect on hepcidin and may explain some of the changes we're seeing as well. So it's almost like an indirect effect on iron status via another body system. But I think a lot of the work that we're drawing conclusions from have come from sort of starvation models, so very extreme changes in energy availability and also from, you know, mouse work. And, and we really need to find a, or conduct research in elite athletes to try and un get a better understanding of some of these underpinning mechanisms.
I would direct your listeners um, towards Alana's latest review, which has just come out in Nutrients, mm. which is open access, because she's put together a really great figure there. It's the only figure in the paper. And, and if you scroll down to that and look at the direction of the arrows, you will see how how much interplay between these things there, there could be. And I think it's a really great figure to kind of put into context the direction of movement of where these things are changing. And it, and it shows how complex it, it will actually turn out to be, I think. Thanks for emphasizing that, Beats. I went through Alana's review to prepare this interview and I will surely uh, make reference to it and I'll also include it on the show notes of this episode along with the image uh, you just mentioned which is uh, pretty helpful for the listeners to understand most of the interactions between low energy availability and iron status in athletes. And there's so many great points in both your answers. Uh, first, to your point, Pete, that it's difficult to know uh, what causes what, if it's low energy availability that leads to reduced iron stores or the other way around. But there seems to be this uh, non-inflammatory driven increase in epsidin as a result of low energy availability by means of reduced energy intake and increased energy expenditure, which seems to induce these peaks in epsidin, thus reducing iron absorption and consequently leading to low iron stores. Also, Erythroferone, as Pete mentioned, can also be regulated by nutrient availability. Erythroferone is the main erythroid regulator of epsidin, the homeostatic hormone controlling plasma iron levels and total uh, body iron. Obviously, I had to look it up. All of these factors are brilliantly explained in Alana's review, which was a result of a joint effort by Alana, David Pine, Louise Burke and Pete himself. And I encourage you to read it if you find this topic interesting. And with this, we reach the final moment of the episode. What take home messages would you leave the listeners with regarding uh, this impact of nutrient availability in the iron regulatory response to exercise? And what research would you like to see performed over the next few years? Alana. Yeah, I think, I think some of this work and, and the work through my PhD is probably um, about highlighting the fact that when we're looking at performance nutrition, we need to um, not only consider the performance outcomes, but but the health outcomes as well. And um, as we were sort of saying, uh, for cyclists, if they're doing very long rides, they're likely to sort of have depleted muscle glycogen stores over time. That's likely to increase the inflammatory response. Um, the exercise duration is also contributing to that low glycogen state. Um, and we can see uh, increases in hepcidin, which, you know, when we're looking at the type of training loads as well that cyclists do um, can uh, to lead to poor iron stores. And not that I would ever say that you should be changing your diet in order to minimize your hepcidin response and disregard performance, but I just think it's a, a out-of-the-box consideration that um, should be thought about when, when working with athletes in that sense. Pete, what would you add to this? Uh, I, I would add to that and, and suggest that um, the one-off session isn't going to be necessarily the straw that breaks the camel's back so if, uh, so that would lead me to say manipulate diet with purpose so if you if you are training low for a purpose that's a session with a purpose you might then periodize your iron intake to um, account for that at a later time um, so that you are replacing uh, as required so it's not the one off it's not the session that you're doing low that's that's going to drive you into an iron deplete status it's that chronic over time not really periodizing your training or periodizing your nutrition appropriately so i think if you get it right then you're going to have minimal impact on on this but if you get it wrong you can see from all of this evidence it could spiral pretty quickly so i would say train and eat with purpose would be the take home and a catchy take-home message that is manipulate diet with purpose. How about research you would like to see performed in this area, Alana? Oh, yeah. Um, so I think really answering that ketogenic diet question um, is at the forefront of my mind at the moment, really determining one way or another whether we are seeing increases in hepcidin or not. Or not. Um, and the low energy availability space is definitely something that um, – you know, we've got some early data on this and uh, hopefully we can keep collecting more um, and looking at what mechanisms are driving it, how big the problem is in elite athletes. All those questions, I think, really need to be answered still. Mm -hmm. How about you, Pete? 
Uh, I agree with that. I think that the low energy availability and red S space is is really interesting, and and that's you know these things can uh, spiral and lead to a, a poor situation, and and that's where we can have an influence. But I think on the other end, on the performance end, we can we can still really um, look to investigate more around periodizing intake. Um, uh, of of iron and of other foods to to try and enhance adaptation and make sure that we certainly aren't um, letting those uh, minerals uh, you know not be replaced um, at times when they might have been neglected as a result of of training with purpose. So certainly, I think periodizing iron intake around around your training schedule would be of interest from a more long term study perspective. Let's leave that immortalized here so that other research groups might perform such research or even your own research group so that you can come back to the podcast again and update us on this topic. Alana, if people want to get in touch or connect with you, where should people go to? Um, it's probably my email is the one I'm on most, so alana.mckay at acu.edu.au or also Twitter. So I think the Twitter handles at McKay Alana. Noted. How about you, Pete? Yep. Uh, Twitter handle at Pete Peeling or email address peter.peeling at uwa.edu.au. Either of those, I'll get back to you. That has a really nice ring to it. And I think you just rhymed, Pete. Anyway, guys, this was really great. I think we get a pretty complete picture of uh, iron metabolism in athletes in the first episode with Rachel. And this one complements the first one really well uh, in showing how different uh, dietary and physiological factors can affect iron absorption in the human body with really important outcomes for endurance athletes to consider. For that, Alana, thanks for coming to the podcast and share your research results with us. No, thanks for having us. It's great. You too, Pete. I hope you have enjoyed the overall experience. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. And there you go. That was episode number 41 of the podcast. Once again, I must remind you that this episode was recorded in January 2021, but only edited now in late June 2022. For that, I present once again my apologies to Alana and Pete, who have been waiting for this episode to be launched. And I hope you all enjoyed this uh, two-episode series on iron metabolism. I will try to resume podcasting with episodes that might be a little bit more practical and applied to cycling due to my involvement with uh, Israel Premier Tech. So stay tuned for what is yet to come and stay safe, guys. This was Feel the Pedal Podcast, over and out. God, I miss saying that.